Okay, hello back everyone. Hello. Welcome back to our second um, symposium a day or one and a half. And um, I'm very happy to introduce um, tonight uh, our second uh, keynote speaker, um, Mira Taif uh, Tofik. Um, I am introducing her instead of Andrena because um, due to working schedule, she was she couldn't be here. So I will do this today. I'm very happy, um, Myra, to have you. Welcome. Thank you. Um, um, Myra Torfik is a Epic Center Professor of Intellectual Property, Commercialization and Strategy at the University of Windsor in Canada. Maya is an expert intellectual in intellectual property law. Her research and teaching interests lie in the areas of copyright law, trademark law, international IP law, IP strategy and IP legal history. In 2014, she was appointed a senior fellow at the Center for International Governance Innovation. Furthermore, Ma uh, Myra has founded and led a number of multidisciplinary clinics, knowledge mobilizations, and community outreach projects designed to provide Canadian startups and innovators with IP literacy skills and access to affordable IP legal services. She's a, res a recipient of a University of, Win of Windsor Award for Outstanding Community Outreach, Knowledge Transfer and Knowledge Mobilization in 2018. To just name one um, of her recent, um, among many others of her recent uh, publications, I would like to highlight uh, copyright history as book history, the law in multidisciplinary context. Please have a look at our sheet if you're interested in more uh, publications and further information. So um, to keep it short, um, Myra, we are happy that, you, that we have you and I will hand you over um, uh, the word. Uh, thanks for participating um, and being um, a contributor to our symposium on copyrights. Thanks. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for ha having me and for, for the warm welcome. Uh, I'm very pleased to be here to talk to you, at least virtually, to talk to you today about copyright law and historical context. For the last uh, <laughs> Too many years I've been studying Canada's copyright history and what I'd like to be able to present to you today is a little bit of, of my findings and how I think that um, understanding the history of copyright law can help us navigate some of the difficulties that we confront in today's uh, world. So to set the stage for my presentation, I wanted to tell you about a legal case that's currently before the courts in Canada. Amel Shamandi is an artist, she's a photographer and a designer from my hometown in Montreal in the province of Quebec. I, perhaps some of you have been there. Uh, Adam Basanta is also a Canadian artist and he uses artificial intelligence, AI, to create what he calls an art factory. So the art factory is basically an art installation. It consists of a series of computers that you can see that scan each other and produce colorful abstract images. Using the process of data mining where uh, an algorithm scours the internet uh, looking for similar images, uh, the algorithm sees patterns in um, large amounts of data that's already available on the internet and matches the computer generated image with um, paintings or artworks that are created by human beings. If the computer finds that there's at least an 80% match, the computer generated image is retained as part of the exhibit. The ones that don't match are deleted. At no time are the original matched artworks reproduced or displayed in Basanta's installation. The only mention of the matched artwork is its title, the artist, the year the work was created and the percentage match. So using this process, Basanta's computer created an image that turned out to be over an 80% match for one of Amal Shamandi's paintings titled uh, Your World Without Paper. So what I'm showing you now is the computer generated image with the, 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 the inscription as it would appear in Basanta's exhibit, sort of 85.81% match. Uh, name, names the artist Chamandi, Your World Without Paper, 2009, created in Basanta's project, we, uh, All We'd Ever Need Is One Another. 
Now this is Shamandi's painting. This is your world without paper. So Shamandi is suing Basanta for copyright infringement. And a number of issues obviously arise. Some of them are absolutely sort of, you know, cutting edge in the copyright law world. And, and uh, the first one is, crit is a critical one, but one that we won't really be exploring or I won't be exploring in detail in my presentation, although it could form the basis of our discussion at the Q&A. Uh, who is the copyright owner? Who is the creator? Who is the author of an artistic work generated by AI? Should copyright be recognized at all? in a computer generated work. But I'd like to reflect on the other two issues that this kind of problem raises. Is there an infringement? Is something that Basanta has done, is that sort of a breach of any of Shamandi's legally recognized rights? Is Basanta's process, the installation itself, doing something that's infringing? It's still unclear in many countries around the world, and we're still trying to grapple with the question of whether or not the act of data mining itself, this idea of scouring the internet through using an algorithm that can pour through uh, massive amounts of, of data to find patterns, whether data mining itself should be considered an infringement of copyright, um, because the process doesn't necessarily make a copy of the original artwork. Is the computer generated image itself a substantial reproduction of Shamandi's paintings? Is the sort of the AI work an infringement if the computer says that it's an 85% match? Um, the test in law is, uh, are the two paintings substantially similar? Is that, should that be the determination of a computer or should this judgment be made by human eyes and expert ev evidence? So when you put the two images side by side, what, is, what do you think in terms of when you look at both of these images? Are, is, is the um, computer generated image a substantial reproduction of uh, the work of Shamandi? Finally, even if there is an infringement, should it be excused somehow? Should what Basanti has done, Basanta, sorry, has done be allowed without Shamandi being able to object or control or secure some financial, control the, the uses of the work and or secure some compensation for the use. What Basanta argues is that he doesn't display her artistic work. Should this be the deciding issue? He argues that he should be able to express his own creativity and experiment in the new potential of artificial intelligence for art. So should the law recognize permitted or allowable uses of copyright works? In other words, the sort of legally acceptable uses by others that would not require the prior permission of the copyright holder. Now, I, I don't wanna get into the technical details of Canada's copyright law and its application in the case. That's not the purpose of my presentation to you today and the court is still deliberating on this question. But what I do want to do is use this example as illustrative of the difficulties and complexities of copyright as it tries to mediate between competing interests. In this case, the right of the original creator of a painting, uh, Shamandi, and the right of Basanta as a user of a copyright work as an, as, and as an artist expressing his own creativity. How we judge the merits of this case whether or not Basanta has done something wrong depends very much on what we understand copyright's purpose to be. Now, copyright is a legal concept. We know that laws arise for multiple re multitude of reasons. They arise to correct injustices, to change behaviors, to address social harms. The, as the English courts are wont to say, uh, what is the mischief that this law is designed to correct? So what we're going to investigate through the lens of history is this question of copyright's primary purpose. What is the mischief that copyright was designed to correct? Can copyright's history offer a principled approach to addressing cases like Shamandi's and Basanta's from an informed policy position? Can we better understand our present by returning to our past? I would suggest that our modern assumption, so the 21st century view about the nature and purpose of copyright, co copyright is that firstly, copyright is primarily designed to protect the property rights of copyright owners. 
And that as a result, a corollary of that is that any legally allowable permitted uses are suspect and are to be restricted or even eliminated entirely. Entirely, and let me just stress what I mean by permitted uses are statutory uses, sort of lawfully uh, determined uses of someone else's copyright work. The ha the hallmark of it is that you don't need to seek permission of the copyright holder in order to do what you want to do. Um, and there are generally two forms. One is a, a pure free use where you don't require permission and you don't require and the payment of compensation isn't required and there are other types of uses where again you don't require the permission of the copyright holder but you will have to pay some form of compensation these kinds of permitted uses are usually enumerated in a country's copyright legislation so this is what I think sort of to give you a visual of what we assume the appropriate copyright paradigm to be that permitted uses are, are a small island in the vast copyright ocean. And I'm drawing here sort of this, this uh, uh, metaphor from US copyright scholar, Jerome Reichman, who observed that intellectual property rights were islands in a sea of the public domain until domestic laws expanded and turned the public domain into a pond surrounded by a continent of rights. So here we are sort of now with large copyright and small permitted uses and public commentary around copyright frequently reflects this underlying assumption. For example, the former director of the United States Copyright Office, Maria Palante in 2012 said, it is my strong view that copyright exceptions and limitations are just that. They are important, but they must be applied narrowly so as not to harm the proprietary rights of the songwriter, book author, or artist. The late Jack Valenti, who was the president of the Motion Picture Association of America said, there is no fair use to take something that doesn't belong to you. That's not fair use. For Shamandi, as she was quoted in the Canadian newspaper, The Globe and Mail in October of 2018, she said, the digital world has become a means for artists and art dealers to promote their works. And for that reason, it is important for copyright to adapt to the digital era, to keep protecting artists who worked hard to be able to live from their art. Her argument is effectively that she should have the right to control all references to or, to or uses of her work, that copyright should protect her against Basanta's activities. Our co contemporary copyright narrative uh, conceptualizes copyright as a property right to safeguard the interests of copyright owners full stop. Our copyright legal discourse has internalized this assumption and has focused its attention on a comparison between the two great Western copyright legal traditions, by which I mean the European droit d'auteur, author's rights tradition like Switzerland, and the British copyright tradition to which um, Canada, the United States, Australia, sort of the British Commonwealth countries subscribe. The legal community makes assumptions about droit d'auteur versus copyright jurisdictions based on a simplistic interpretation of the terms used to describe the legal entitlement, whether the law is principally intended for creators or authors, or whether the economic interests of industries that disseminate works of art and literature are its primary concern. Here's a very good example of what I mean. In a decision of our Supreme Court in 2002, one of the judges on the court, Justice Gontier, made this statement. He said, the use of the word copyright in the English version of the act has obscured the fact that what the act fundamentally seeks to protect is le droit d'auteur. In Canada, copyright is federal law. It therefore it follows the British tradition. However, Canada is a bilingual country and our statutes, our legislation is draft, our, our, our statutes are drafted in both official languages, French and English. The English title of our legislation, as you see from the, the image on the slide, is the Copy, Copyright Act. And the French title is Loi sur le droit d'auteur. Now these terms should theoretically be interpreted as synonyms since they're merely intended as English or and French translations of the same title of the same statute. But what Justice Gonti is suggesting here is that it means something quite different to speak of copyright on the one hand and droit d'auteur or author's rights on the other. The European droit d'auteur tradition, as I say, Switzerland is of that particular uh, uh, 
tradition literally means the right of the author or the author's rights. The assumption here based on the title is that copyright's primary purpose is to safeguard the interests of the creator um, of artistic, literary, musical, or dramatic works. The British copyright tradition, the word copyright, which today we tend to think of in terms of, you know, the right to make copies, but really it is uh, actually, it means the right to the copy as in the right to the manuscript. Who has the right to publish the manuscript? It's utilitarian. It doesn't, it, it doesn't focus on whether it's the author or the publisher who has the right to publish. Ultimately, the way the system operated, it was the author who gave the right to the publisher uh, to, to print and publish books at the, at the time, literally, therefore, the right, who owns the manuscript, who, who, and, and who has the right to copy. So here, the assumption is that the primary focus of the law is on protecting the interests of industry, the intermediaries who ensure that creative works are disseminated. At copyright's inception, as I say, that meant the publishing industry. In other words, within the British copyright tradition, uh, the emphasis is, is on sort of copyright as a publisher's right, as a right of industry. And in fact, that's, that's what I was taught, that copyright is a publisher's right. Of course, both authors, creators, and the agencies through which works are disseminated uh, to the public are integral to the, to, to, to the functioning of the system, whether you're a droit d'auteur or a copyright jurisdiction. In fact, in, in, in our laws, both authors and proprietors, basically those intermediaries, the industry, are expressly recognized uh, in the statutes themselves. So the differences between the, the droit d'auteur tradition and the copyright tradition is really a question of degree. But what I would suggest is that the way one views the law's predominant orientation will influence the way the law is drafted and interpreted. So Justice Gontier, of our Supreme Court is suggesting that Canada's copyright law is author-centered, which means that he would interpret the legislation in a way that places the interests of creators, authors at the forefront. Now I started to delve into the archives to try and discover sort of Canada's history with a view to testing Justice Gontier's assertion. Was Canada's copyright law at its origin author-centered? or industry-centered. It didn't take me long to realize that the dichotomy between author-centered and industry-centered is actually a false one. Canada's first Copyright Act originated in 1832, and it was in the former British colony of Lower Canada. So, you know, I'm not gonna get into Canada's history, but this was before Canada as a country came into being. At that time, so Lower Canada was a, a British province. It was a society that was poor and the population was largely illiterate. So Lower Canada didn't have authors or publishers to speak of. And certainly none who were concerned about others copying their work without their permission. So it struck me, so why would the legislature in 19th century Lower Canada see fit to enact a copyright law under those conditions? What was copyright if it wasn't about authors or industry? What I'm arguing as a result of my research is that a view of copyright is one that privileges copyright owners above all other interests or considerations is fundamentally wrong. It doesn't matter which copyright tradition you subscribe to, droit d'auteur or copyright, we've forgotten the foundational principles that gave rise to the legislation in the first place. So in my exploration of Canada's copyright history, what I'm hoping to be able to do is to add copyright, Canada's story to a mapping of the copyright's origin stories of other countries to create a tapestry of contexts to determine whether there are patterns that can be considered overarching, some kinds of universal principles. While laws originate within a particular time and place, and certainly I'm not suggesting that 1832 Lower Canadian copyright law is automatically relevant today, um, there may never, and, and, and sort of, and therefore, you know, laws will behave differently uh, depending on different contextual environments. There may nevertheless be some principles that transcend time and place, uh, and which therefore may be as relevant today as they were when they were first constructed. So my excursions into the archives 
have led me to suggest two copyright truths. First, copyright is not and, and should not be viewed as a copyright owner's right. Copyright was not intended to protect authors or publishers per se. In other words, the goal wasn't to reward authors for the mere fact of having created something nor was it toward, uh, to reward printers and publishers for their entrepreneurial activities. Instead, providing exclusive protection to creators and industry was the means to a larger policy end. The world's first modern copyright act originated in England in 1710. We know it as the Statute of Anne, but its full title was an act for the encouragement of learning by vesting the copies of printed books in the authors or purchasers of such copies during the times herein mentioned. The phrase for the encouragement of learning actually meant something back then. Copyright was knowledge or education centered policy. That was its purpose. And this came through especially as I started to look back in, in Canada's history. So what I found, and here's the sort of the, the image of what 18th and 19th centuries co uh, century copyright looked like. Copyright was actually an island in the vast sea of the public domain. And by public domain, I mean the sort of the communal, unrestricted and unregulated spaces that permitted, permit other people to engage with um, protected works um, and, and, and sort of, and, you know, or, or unprotected works in the context of the public domain. The idea of a small copyright in a large public domain was to encourage authors and publishers to put books to market, to produce them and disseminate them. In the absence of exclusive control over the publication of a work, there was little incentive for authors to write books uh, and for publishers to publish those books, since these books could be freely copied by others with impunity. We have to remember that books um, in the 18th and 19th centuries were the most important mass medium of, of the time for the dissemination of knowledge uh, and ideas. It's no coincidence then that copyright arose in the period of, of sort of European enlightenment, um, and which placed value, uh, you know, tremendous value on the importance of education, knowledge and learning. So this era of, of the enlightenment, which we also know as the age of reason, uh, was an intellectual movement in the 17th and 18th centuries, largely in Europe, that placed great emphasis on rational thought and scientific inquiry and discovery. And it was during this period that copyright laws began to emerge. So 1710 in the United Kingdom, 1790 in the United States, 1793 in France. Let me just digress here for a moment, just sort of add a, ca a caveat that as lofty and noble as enlightenment ideals were, they were also elitist and exclusionary. Copyright as a legal concept born of Western enlightenment favors individualistic con concepts of ownership, entitlement, privilege, and commerce. Copyright is therefore itself exclusionary. For example, it's not a collaborative concept. So forms of communal art, collaborative um, uh, uh, sort of gr group, group art, especially um, with respect to indigenous communities uh, have been largely excluded from the scope of copyright. Copyright arose out of print technology. So has had trouble with creativity that is not manifested in print. So for example, in the visual arts. Um, and it has been especially harsh towards works of artistic craftsmanship, basically um, works that are aesthetically uh, creative, but are applied to useful products or articles like quilts, for example. These works largely created by women have made copyright somewhat gendered. Nevertheless, taking those limitations aside, there's no question that enlightenment values, uh, which emphasized um, education and scholarly inquiry, led to the emergence of copyright. And you can situate copyright, so the emergence of the law, in the context of other vehicles, the creation of other vehicles designed to fulfill these same goals. So if you look at this period in history, you see uh, a number of, of uh, mechanisms designed to expand uh, uh, and, and share knowledge and ideas. 
this was a period of, of great uh, creation of learned societies and associations. Um, they used to, you know, obviously, we still we still have them. I mean, this is this is an example. This presentation is an example of the exchange of knowledge, I guess, um, that that universities, learned societies, and other associations promoted, so that they would have a, active public lecture circuit, uh, people would do research and, and deliver presentations on their research and knowledge was shared and communicated widely. Libraries, libraries, I mean, think about public libraries as a spaces within which, uh, you know, uh, the, 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 even the most um, economically disadvantaged could access sort of knowledge uh, through uh, the, the sort of yeah, attending at libraries or borrowing books. Um, so the, the advent of the library movement as, as another vehicle for knowledge uh, uh, dissemination became very important in these periods. Universities, proliferated have started to become established, all these centers of higher education, museums that sort of you know, collected sort of scientific and other knowledge, um, again, started to, to emerge as uh, important forces for the diffusion of ideas. More importantly, at least for our purposes, this was also a period that was characterized by um, greater attention to the idea of universal education and the development of free public school systems for everyone. Uh, and so um, if you think about uh, uh, the, the colonial context sort of 19th century North America, especially in the colonies that were to become Canada, copyright arose very specifically out of the concerns about the need to facilitate public education. And, and this was true for the United States as well. So talk about North American copyright. These were economically underdeveloped societies with very limited public infrastructure. In the developing world of North America in that period, an educated population was essential to advancing socioeconomic and political objectives. But illiteracy was rampant and there was, there was no system of public education to speak of. So the mischief, the problem that copyright was designed to address was quite literally about encouraging learning by facilitating school book production. But let me show you how Canada's first Copyright Act arose in 1832. So when I looked through the legislative journals of that period, I discovered a number of petitions. So those are based, there were requests by individuals to the, the legislature um, in, in seeking uh, some redress for, for uh, a harm or, or so, something that, a, a missing gap that they felt they were entitled to. It was, petitions were a very common way uh, for citizens to, to seek some kind of redress from, from their, 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 the government basically. And what I found was that there were a series of petitions from school teachers going before the legislature and explaining that they had produced a manuscript copy that handwritten uh, a school book that they, they thought would be useful um, to teach children, but they couldn't afford the cost of printing. And so they asked the, the legislature for financial assistant, assistance to help them defray those printing costs. So these were authors, yes, but they came before the legislature as teachers concerned about being unable to effectively teach without the ability to make copies of their manuscripts. So for example, William Morris was a teacher in Quebec City uh, in, 18, in the 1830s. And he went before the legislature and you see he says, I have a manuscript book on arithmetic, arithmetic that I've written. And I've tried to use as much as I could from that, you know, teach my students from that one copy. But he says, the want of printed copies basically have, has prevented me from making use of it altogether. I'm the, of the opinion that if my work was printed and put into practice, children could learn all the rules that it contains in one year. And this is what he, this is his problem. He says, I haven't been able to get it printed. Mr. Carey, who was a, a printer, a local printer at the time, would not print it except at a price he could not afford. So he went to the legislature and he asked for um, 50 pounds at the time to be able to cover the cost of printing. It's important to understand this, this petition then was referred, the committee that William Morris is talking to or talking about was actually the Committee of Ed on Education and Schools. So the Standing Committee on Education and Schools was given William Morris's petition to um, you know, determine whether or not uh, a legislative grant was warranted. 
and the committee that reviewed Morris's uh, petition determined that the problem he confronted was actually a systemic one. So instead of merely acquiescing to, to his request and granting it, they did it anyway, they granted him 50 pounds so that he could get his particular book published. The committee recommended the enactment of a copyright law for the province as a better solution, not only for Morris, but for all others like him. The assumption was at the time that with a period of exclusivity, so um, under the 1832 Copyright Act, um, the uh, copyright owners, and in this case, sort of they were trying to encourage printers and publishers, would get 28 years of exclusive protection against competitors. The, the, the assumption was that with that exclusive period of, of monopoly, that printers would lower their costs of printing because they'd be able to recover their costs and make a profit over a, a long 28 period, uh, a, a period where no one else could enter the, the market with um, the same sort of a reprint of the same book. This pattern of teachers coming before the legislature with manuscripts and being unable to afford the cost of printing was similar in, other British, in the other British colonies in North America, as well as in the United States. So copyright emerged in, as a legal response to a problem of school book supply. So the question becomes, was the North American experience exceptional? You know, does it transcend sort of beyond the, the conditions of those particular societies in, in the uh, late 18th and early 19th, and 19th centuries? Well, if we look at what I'm gonna call the old world, sort of, you know, uh, the, the United Kingdom and Europe, the old world exper experience exemplified by the United Kingdom and by France, France being a droit d'auteur jurisdiction and, and England, as I explained, a copyright one, exhibits similar patterns. Even though copyright in these developed countries originated at a time where there was an established book trade and a very strong publishing industry, and, and these societies had uh, important authors who enjoyed power and privilege, lawmakers addressed the question of copyright from a similar concern, albeit, albeit from an opposite starting point. So as I've explained sort of in North America, Copyright was initiated uh, in the recognition that too little copyright, when you don't have any copyright, so no protection for authors and publishers, that this was harmful to the advancement of learning because there was no incentive for authors or publishers to, to, to distribute, to, to disseminate the knowledge contained in books. In contrast, in England and France, copyright law was initiated to, to reverse the situation of too much copyright. In other words, too much control. Uh, on the, in the hands of the printing and publishing industry uh, with the recognition that if you have too much protection, there would be similar negative effects on the overarching goal of encouraging learning. So in the 17th century, 17th century England, prior to the Sat Statute of Anne, the Stationers Company, which is the term that's used for the, um, to describe the representatives of the British book trade at the time, um, it's where we get the word stationary among other things, but uh, printers, publishers, booksellers, they controlled all of the printing of books in the United Kingdom. Books that were not sanctioned by this guild could not circulate. So the stationers acted as much as censors um, of, of unwanted literature as they did as publishers. Now the monopoly had been given to them by the king and their rights were perpetual, they lasted forever. As a result of this very strong monopoly, they became very powerful. And as the 17th century came to a close and as enlightenment ideas about kind of the importance of, 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 of you know, expansive learning, or more expansive learning became um, more prominent, um, the monopolistic powers of these printers and publishers became a, a, a real impediment to the free circulation of knowledge. So the stationer's monopoly was dismantled and the British legislature introduced the Statute of Anne instead. So the Statute of Anne was a pullback from too much uh, of a monopoly control over the circulation of books. This statute had many anti-monopolistic features. It was of limited duration, it wasn't perpetual. The, so the printers and publishers in England went from you know, a perpetual right to a right that only lasted 14 years with the possibility of another 14 year renewal. There were mandatory registration formalities in order to secure the benefits of the legislation. 
The act contained a rule that prevented booksellers from selling books at exorbitant prices, therefore to ensure that books were accessible to the masses. And it required that copies of each protected book be donated to a specific university library. Again, the idea that uh, as part of the uh, reward or so that this monopoly for 14 years, you have to give a book, uh, the book that's published um, to a university library to enhance their collection and therefore obviously enhance the learning of their students. Finally, these early copyright laws only protected the copyright owner against literal or verbatim copying. In other words, the scope of protection was narrow. Now, the statute of Anne was transplanted into North America and was the starting point for both American and Canadian copyright laws. But the same anti-monopolistic features are characteristic of the first French copyright legislation as well, which was enacted in post-revolutionary France in 1793. So a study of the French experience reveals similar concerns about the need to encourage education and learning as the predominant legislative preoccupation. When the French Copyright Act was passed, the debate within the legislature was around how much authors' rights should be allowed to interfere with the public interest in education and learning. And when the uh, statute was enacted, oversight uh, over the legislation was given to the Committee on Public Instruction. So similar to the Can Lower Canadian Standing Committee on Education in Schools, copyright and, and public education were intertwined in those days. So in all of these iterations, regardless of whether we're referring to old world or new world copyright, these legislative features were the hallmarks of a balanced approach to the law that placed the advancement of learning as its paramount concern. So this then leads me to the second copyright truth, that permitted uses of copyright works are integral features of the law. So as I've mentioned, at its earliest, Copyright only protected copyright owners against literal or verbatim reprinting of their books or other printed material. However, as time progressed, questions emerged about whether copyright protection should extend to stop others from, for example, translating existing copyright works or adapting or summarizing those works making an abridgment of those works. In other words, should the copyright owner be able to stop others from activities that went beyond the literal or verbatim reproduction of the protected work? And if so, to what extent? So the concept of permitted uses emerged when copyright rights themselves began to expand away from literal reprinting to what the British court started to call colorable imitations. When you have larger copyright rights and a smaller public domain, you have to develop rules to determine the boundary between an infringement and a fair use. Otherwise, you might unduly constrain the development of new knowledge. So to, to remain true to copyright's foundational purposes, to sort of that policy of encouraging learning, the law introduced these safe spaces, these permitted uses to enable education, adaptation, experimentation, and improvement. So scholarly and doctrinal commentary at the time expressed it, I think, quite well. Um, Drone uh, was a, a very important British copyright um, legal scholar and, and doctrinal commentator. And uh, in his, you know, um, uh, in his book, Drawn on Copyright, he, in 1879, he refers to this idea of fair use and he says that the recognition of the doctrine of, fair, of a fair use is essential to the growth of knowledge, as it would obviously be a hindrance to learning if every work were a sealed book to all subsequent authors. Too much copyright protection uh, means uh, sort of too much monopoly control over access to copyright works. And so he was reflecting the need again to advance education um, by permitting some kinds of uses. Numadro, who is uh, the president of the uh, diplomatic conference on the Berne Convention. Now, many of you may be familiar with the Berne Convention. It's the most important uh, international copyright treaty 
um, today. I mean, it, it's, it was first uh, uh, passed in 1886, and it remains the, the premier international copyright treaty. The president of the, Dipl the, the diplomatic conference on the Berm Convention explained um, that the ever-growing need for mass instruction could never be met if there were no reservation of certain reproduction facilities, by which he means by the capacity to make copies basically without permission. So limits on absolute protection are dictated by the public interest. So with all of that background in mind, this is what we've forgotten. Copyright is not a copyright owner's right, whether we think the owner is the primary owner or, or interest is that of the author creator or of the industry publisher. It is a combination of interests that converge to achieve an overarching goal. The idea obviously, as I've explained, to encourage the development and sharing of knowledge, learning, ideas, and creativity. Therefore, any expansion of a copyright right must necessarily take into account its impact on the overarching interest of encouraging learning. You can't have copyright rights without paying commensurate attention to permitted uses, which is what we have started to refer to in Canada as user rights. So copyright rights and user rights. So what does this mean for us today? Has anything changed in terms of the value we place on education, knowledge, and learning that would make this history of copyright irrelevant? Um, I would suggest that understanding this history is even more essential as we confront some of our era's most troubling challenges. Education, knowledge, and learning are cornerstones of human well being and essential to healthy democracies. Copyright's legitimacy remains dependent on the extent to which it advances this social good. The false dichotomy between droit d'auteur and copyright obfuscates the true interests at play. It forces the debate surrounding copyright's purpose into binary property constructs, and it obscures and diminishes the interests of users, basically the learners who are ultimately at the center of the act for the encouragement of learning. Permitted uses, these user rights, remain indispensable features of the entire copyright system. They are not loopholes to be constrained or eliminated. In fact, there's no copyright law today that doesn't permit certain uses of copyright works without permission, uh, especially for educational purposes. So it's my understanding that under Swiss copyright law, the private use of published works among friends and family is permitted without prior consent or compensation to the copyright owner. Your law also permits the use of a copyright work without permission by a teacher for educational purposes, although in this situation compensation must be paid. The point, though, is that the copyright owner can't refuse the educational use. In Canada, we have a permitted use called fair dealing, which allows us to use a copyright work for enumerated purposes like private study, research, and education. Under this rule, we don't have to get permission, nor do we have to pay any compensation. Now, what are these examples, if not modern manifestations of the centuries old preoccupation with encouraging learning? What history teaches us is that copyright is a system of checks and balances between copyright owners and users of copyright works in order to achieve a larger social objective. To fulfill its purpose, copyright must therefore be sufficiently robust to encourage individuals to create, express, and disseminate works without fear of rampant copying. In other words, to guard against the disincentive that results from too little copyright. But copyright must also permit copyright works to be studied, pulled apart, critiqued, built upon, transformed, and reimagined by others without fear of reprisals. In other words, to guard against the chilling effect of too much copyright. Within this paradigm, the fundamental question becomes where we should draw the line between copyright rights and user rights, not whether we should draw a line at all. Vesting copyright owners with too much control over the flow of knowledge and information without appropriate legally recognized, recognized safeguards is especially dangerous in today's climate of fake news and alternate truths. The freedom to learn, to criticize, to dissent, and to challenge are essential tools of resistance to control and manipulation through disinformation. 
Recognizing copyright as education policy rather than as property equips policymakers, civil society activists, and quite frankly, all of us, we're all users and creators of copyright works with the ability to defend the centrality of permitted uses within our, our modern copyright constructs. So in light of this brief travel back in time and with this historical background and these foundational copyright truths in mind, let's look again at Amel Shamandi and Adam Basanta. How should the line be drawn in this case? I'm going to end here so that we can open the discussion. As visual artists yourselves, you can probably sympathize with both of these Canadian creators. And I would be especially interested to hear your take or your thoughts about this case and about how copyright influences and affects you. Of course, I'll, I mean, obviously I'll take any questions on the presentation itself or on any aspects of copyright law in general. Thank you very much for your um, uh, patience and for uh, listening to me today. <clears throat> so thank you very much for oh, you don't see me uh, for your um, very interesting and and um, great and profound um, um, contribution. Uh, should we make maybe a few minutes uh, a break, or do you want to continue with questions? It, it's really up to you what, 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 what's happening in the room. If people want to take a break, that's fine. If people have a burning urge to, to, to tell me what they think about uh, how they would judge this particular case, um, we could launch into the discussion right away. So I'll leave it to you. I'm fine. It's the middle of the day here, uh, and <laughs> I don't need to, to, to move around that much. So. Uh, could you maybe close your presentation? Yes. Thanks. Is that better? Oops. Yes, thanks. Okay. okay. So should we go on or should we have a, a little break? <clears throat> what do you, how do you feel? Go on, huh? Okay, because we have already a long day um, uh, behind us. So are there any questions? I mean, Mara, that's a, I think that's a very good sign because we are all just mesmerized uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> of, of the input. So it's not, or it was incomprehensible. Um, <laughs> yeah. Look, well, can I ask? I, you know, but those of you, you're obviously kind of. I mean, did did any of what uh, what the 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 this this litigation the case that's happening in Canada did, did sort of did, how do you think what do you think about um, where the line should be drawn do you think that what Basanta has done is something that would uh, if you were the the shamandi that that, that would be something that would um, would cause you harm in a way that the law should step in or do you feel otherwise how far should creativity go um, in terms of enabling others to use what you've created Um, do I understand correctly that um, he's suing this guy because um, he used his name? Just no, that's actually it's a really good point. I I mean, there, it, there is that element as well. She, she, uh, the uh, the artist is a woman, um, and and we're not. She, she's also she is complaining uh, under a different body of law about the use of her name. It's not. That's that's the point. Is what what the it, it's because this this computer generated image has determined that uh, what has been generated is an eighty five percent match of one of her paintings. I mean, that's really at the end, at the end of the day what what's happened here. But like visually, we don't. I mean, I don't saw just um, you know, just the color. Yeah. Uh, it was just the, for me. It was just the color. So I, I think it's. 
not a match. <laughs> no, I, I mean, I, I mean, I would, I would tend to agree. I mean, you know, that if, if by looking at, you know, again, if you assume that Basanta, the, 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 um, you know, the, the computer, the, 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 the fellow who uses computers in this way, that his, his process is something that, you know, it, we should value. Um, ultimately, um, you know, he hasn't, what has he done? He, what he did was, he div there's an algorithm scours the internet. Um, Shamandi's painting was on her website. So it's, it's, it's there, it's, it's visible sort of online in that sense. The computer then scanned and discovered that painting from her website and determined based on criteria that I don't, I don't know, but based on the criteria that the algorithm determines says there are 85% of the elements are matches. Now, you know, and, and yet is that's, that's my question is, is there anything in what he's doing that, 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 that legitimates, let's say, Shamandi's concern that the law to step in um, in the digital world to, uh, to, 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 to say that Basanta shouldn't be able to do what he's doing. I mean, you know, he, never in any of the, in Basanta's work is, is the original artwork presented. It's, it's, never, it's never there, just her name and the title of the painting. So I agree. I mean, I find it, you know, it is before the courts. It's, it's going to be um, an interesting decision when it's rendered, but it really does push the limits of what, you know, sort of um, the original artist, uh, you know, believes she's entitled to stop. And, and so the way the courts then will decide this, I think will be fundamentally important in, again, defining these boundaries between protection and public domain, um, copyright rights, user rights, uh, and, and finding that appropriate balance. But does uh, uh, the digital work mm -hmm. it's still digital? So it's just a test. It's not, it, this was not the only picture that they use for this algorithm. So if, if the no. art digital yeah. would print it or public it as a new painting or as a new print, then I'm okay. Uh, yeah. with that you can uh, <laughs> contact it, it, say yeah. that in my right that you cannot use my painting right but if it does but yeah not that to create a, a painting and only one so it's a process and in this yeah. process it's not that she has produced an image it's just a process this yeah. 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 so for me it's no she can do nothing against yeah. if the yeah. other artists start to yeah print or make a book, then it's another thing. Yes. But it's just a process yeah. at the moment. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So you might draw the line at the moment at which the, let's say, Basanta sort of starts to make commercial use of the images. So produces a book, for example, with the computer generated images. Do this, no, then it's, a, then I understand. Yeah. But then yeah. It, it's not interesting what pictures this computer was doing. Right. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But cool, it's the idea behind of our. Yeah. 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 So yeah. Please. <laughs> yeah. No, I think that's true. I mean, I think his whole, uh, you know, argument is that he's experimenting with computer generated art. He's experimenting with the limits between human creativity and machine creativity. I mean, the process itself is what he's interested in, not, not necessarily what it produces. Um, and obviously, uh, but, but because it does, um, scan existing artworks uh, and it did, did re reflect or at least kind of, um, um, you know, cite her work. Uh, I, that's where the complaint arises. Um, yeah, no, it's how much of, uh, I don't know, coincidences have role in law? Because like to me, that seems just like a result of coincidence and there is no intention of create like reproducing that painting actually yeah. so yeah. like to me it's of course yeah. like there shouldn't be any copyright laws uh, yeah. against this kind of use yeah uh, no and that's a very good point i mean one of our assumptions is that if you're if you're infringing someone's copyright you actually um 
you had reference to as you were creating the the computer generated image there was reference to the um you referred to or you're copying from someone else uh, and that's not it doesn't seem to be the process here it's really that the the computer generated image which is random like it, it it's just a random image um it, it it's validated after the fact by you know it being a match with a human created our artwork. So there wasn't even there isn't even this idea that uh, you know the computer referred to Shamandi's painting in developing the computer generated image. And so again, this uh, sort of the, this the, the the case itself is really testing some of the the boundaries. These boundaries that we you know we we understand as being important um, and and challenging those boundaries. Um, so you know obviously the the decision when the court renders it will be an important case because it will sort of again you know either affirm or or you know develop kind of new doctrine but around this particular moment when you know we're we're embarking on the wonders of sort of technology and machine created art and and whether or not we should be able to um control you know new ideas new processes new experiments especially if there hasn't been any um uh, ref reference to the original copyright work uh in in developing the machine or the automated image so absolutely do you think does it work? Yeah. Do you think like the result of, uh, I mean, this decision of the court would affect like future uh, copyright issues like this one, especially in Canada, I assume it would affect it, right? And also, yeah. Yeah. yeah, and there will be like more and more artificial intelligence created artworks, I guess. So yeah. it's pretty important. Yeah. Like and in fact, yeah, no, absolutely. And it, it may not be ultimately the courts um, left to the courts to deal with copyright and AI um, because uh, you know increasingly you know Canada Australia England I'm assuming sort of Switzerland and are, are starting to look at whether or not to actually um, uh, put in legislative provisions to, to determine whether or not you know to make a policy decision should uh, a computer generated work um, have its own copyright even though you know that I mean, you know, obviously, there's a human being behind the software, and there's a human being behind the process. But the artwork itself, should it should a should a machine hold copyright? Um, and 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 you know, what are the policy reasons around that? Why again, it might take us back to why was copyright created in the first place? It was an incentive for human beings. If the incentive isn't there for a machine, should we still? you know, validate sort of the, the creation through, um, a, you know, a, a monopoly, a right that lasts, you know, in many countries for the life of the author, there's of course no author here or human author, it was intended as a human author, um, computers or machines don't die, but, but, um, but, you know, plus 70 years after death, I mean, a very long period of time, how would we, what kind of period or framework would we give to a, an AI generated uh, copyright work. What what is the policy around that? And and you know people obviously have very very mixed views about this. So it's a it's you know it's it's not an easy answer. Um, uh, and and that is going to be I think the next frontier is is as if as visual artists if you start to use sort of technology as part of your um, cre you know creative expression in the way let's say Basanta has done. Where does, you know, where do your rights as the, the human creator and the, the rights, uh, if any, of the machine, um, where do they begin and end? Uh, and those are really tricky policy questions that we haven't really ever had to think about before because, you know, art, literature, was we it was always developed by humans you know we never you know we never we, we assumed that um so so what happens now um and so there will be the implications of this decision will be quite significant um in terms of of what the court ultimately decides and that might lead to um policy changes to the legislation or um it might uh, you know i assume the decision too will will be appealed all the way up to our supreme court but yeah, that's a very important point. Uh, I've got a question. Were there any familiar cases in other countries with similar rules in the background? About uh, artificial intelligence or? 
um, were there already like some decisions made by other courts in other countries or is it like the first uh, case like that? Well, this is probably the most one, the most significant that 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 to, that that ex, that exists today. Um, you know, there have been decisions in in, in other countries relating to um, sort of computer generated works, but where the there there was much more human involvement. So there was actually so you could say it in offense, it was jointly created by a human being and a machine. But this this particular process, these the, the there's the the computers are just programmed to take images at random of the room and of each other and create these abstract you know colorful pictures. Um, and so there's there's other than the I mean you could say that the human being who programmed them to do that um, you know may, maybe the one that you know. The, the human creator, but the, the artwork itself, which is normally where we vest the copyright is actually what's expressed, uh, you know, in print or on canvas or whatever, um, that's purely machine driven. And so it's one of the, the, the it's unique as a case for, for that. Um, and so, uh, you know, coming to, to grips with what that means, especially because the capabilities of, of, dig, of data mining. So where, you know, issues have come up is in, in, in before um, courts or, or legislatures relate to this process of data mining, you know, scouring the internet, sort of finding patterns and then, you know, developing uh, theories or producing something out of those patterns. Um, and, and so, that is, 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 is a separate but related question that has actually come before the courts before. Um, but, but whether or not sort of this, this the, the, you've got a, a new artistic work created by a machine, whether or not that's done anything that infringes um, the, the, the original human, human being creator of a particular painting, uh, when there's no substantial similarity to the human eye, where it wasn't copied, there was no reference, it wasn't reproduced in any way, and the uh, machine did not refer to the original artwork when it produced its image. And those are really new issues. Um, and so it's a case that's being watched uh, quite closely, um, at least sort of in, in copyright jurisdictions, sort of those that, that, uh, that have uh, an, uh, you know, a similar kind of uh, statutory regime. Decision expected? I'm sorry? When is the decision? <laughs> it's a good question. I tried to look. I looked at the court records and I looked at, um, there is no, uh, I cannot, I can't uh, find any information about when the court is expected to render the judgment. I mean, it, it's, it's now sort of roughly, the lawsuit was commenced in, in 2018. I'd expect sometime in early 2020, sometime in the new year. Hello, Myra. I'm Dominic. Hi. I would like to go back to Hi, the Dominique. hello to the two visualizations with the circles, the big circle and the yeah. small circle, and you were using sort of the same visualization for two different. Would you like to have? Oh, it's okay. So the the circles, the big one and the small one. Mm -hmm. where you said that uh, in the 19th century we had the public domain was mm -hmm. uh, the big circle and the small one was the um, fair use. I think it also said there. And Sorry. Oh, oh, the copyright. Yes, of no. course. The public domain, the copyright, and then uh, taking it for uh, the visualization that corresponds with our time now. It's the other way around. So, uh, and now what you've been describing with data mining and uh, artificial intelligence, are you actually saying now with uh, digitalization, that is what's happening, that uh, this fair use circle is getting smaller and the copyright issue is bigger. Um, how to deal with that? Well, I, th I think I, mean, I hope that sort of part of it is that uh, all of you now have become sensitized to this idea that, you know, the expansion of copyright rights um, and, you know, and, and I can give you examples of how we've done that in the digital world, for example, um, uh, uh, through uh, copy control technologies that are now kind of, uh, you know, protected under our copyright schemes. Um, and I, I mean, I, I can explain a little bit more, but I'll just try and get to the question first, is I think first of all is by, is by recognizing and not being lulled into this idea that, that, that 
stronger copyright is necessarily good from a large public policy perspective from you know that and i think that's an argument that so it the, the argument that the, the the more copyright is needed is is conflated with this idea that the more copyright you have the more benefits to society there will be i mean i think that's the sort of the 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 um the equation. I mean, that's what that, that's the way copyright is often portrayed. So I think we really need to take a step back and understand, sort of, look at history, look at policy, look at the ways in which too much copyright can actually encroach on other fundamental freedoms, um, and and maintain sort of those arguments and in our own practices, sort of represent that balance. You know, recognize that um, we, you know, whatever we produce as creators of copyright works, there may be uses. That that are absolutely legitimate that we will have no control over. And that's that's a good thing. That's part of the system. So, and it means going to policy legislatures and, and sort of, you know, intervening. I mean, I don't know, in Canada, we had a very uh, important um, review of our Copyright Act very recently. And uh, it, the, the government takes these to public consultations. And so people can present sort of write, write in and, and put down what their thinking is and, and, um, and can meet with actually the committee that's reviewing the legislation. So a lot of, there's a lot of activism in a sense that could happen if we fear that whatever's being proposed is either too much copyright or too little copyright. Um, and as creators of copyright works yourselves, I mean, you're the best place. I mean, to be able to advocate for a balanced view, because, you know, as I said, we're, we're all copyright um, producers and users. Um, and so finding that appropriate balance, I think, and continuously reflecting on the importance of it um, is what we, we all need to do to sort of shift that um, you know, these, these assumptions that are being made and the reasons for it. I mean, you know, the, the, you know, I didn't have time to get into a lot of the, the, the circumstances that have conspired to put us in this strong copyright model that, that more copyright is, is necessarily better. Um, and, you know, it's the sort of the primacy of the economic model, the commodification of knowledge through international trade agreements. Um, there are sort of uh, economists in, you know, in, in, in the US and the UK and in other countries that say that permitted uses are historical anachronisms. They were designed only at a time when it wasn't easy for users to find copyright owners to get permission. But now with uh, you know, digital rights management technologies where you can embed in your digital work information about yourself as the copyright owner and what, what someone needs to do in order to get permission, we don't need permitted um, uses anymore because copyright clearance getting permission can be done through technology. Um, and so these are the sort of the, the, the arguments that are brought to bear to restrict or even eliminate the idea of permitted uses. So if we view them as essential to the entire, the functioning of the system, um, then, you know, and we use, I mean, for me, I use history as, as, as a way of, of building that argument. Uh, I think we can push back against the, these assumptions um, that, that, you know, uh, you, I, you know, you, you know, if you look closely, or not even that closely, you'll see them play out sort of in a number of different fora. This, this, you know, that more is good. Um, the the sky is falling. Every new technology, uh, the argument is the sky is falling because the new technology is now going to make, um, you know, everything that that we create sort of irrelevant. And uh, you know, them. I mean, but it, 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 these are arguments that I think we need to be a little bit more sophisticated. Uh, and informed about. Good. I got the microphone. If I may ask a question, I agree it's an interesting case. I may want to look at it even a bit like on a more, make more a bit more open the scope. Like, is it, I mean, it's a art, artwork about artificial intelligence. It's probably also, or maybe a case about copyright by comparing like the work that was computer generated by existing ones. So it's kind of provoking maybe even the fact that it's there is going to be a legal case and is it maybe even that the original work or the, the the artist of the original work intentionally sued like the art piece to kind of be part of the story because after <laughs> all it becomes kind of a a twin uh, with the artwork which yeah. is completely generated and i mean artists use business like auctions for their art and um, why wouldn't they use also like uh, lawsuits for uh, promoting or for uh, reflecting their art 
with, uh, That's a fantastic with point. <laughs> That's a fantastic point. I mean, you know, even one of the things that uh, Basanta said, you know, before he was sued, or at the time he was sued, they're, they're, you know, they were both interviewed by a number of uh, news outlets. Uh, but in one of these points he made is why would my installation, my installation is actually enhancing her work, because it's making it more, I mean, you know, she's, she's being re represented, or at least the inscription suggests that there's an artist by the name of Shamandi who's got this particular painting, it's going to make people go and look for her work. And your point is, <laughs> is a good one too, that, that she, you know, she's, she, the, the lawsuit itself um, may, may not, she may not necessarily deep in her heart feel that she's actually got an absolutely strong case, but nevertheless, that, that, that the, that she becomes part of the discussion and that, you know, there's, there's, there's a sort of a, uh, an engagement sort of in the creative process uh, through her uh, her initiating this lawsuit. So it's a very expensive way to do that, but um, but uh, but perhaps that's right. You know, I mean, it, it did it did lead, of course, to a lot of uh, press uh, interest and interest in her own work, um, the, the the lawsuit because it's um, intriguing. You know, ha has led to a, a probably more publicity um, uh, and good publicity for her than that. Not necessarily in terms of the the legal issues, but just kind of more awareness of the fact that she is an artist and that she produces these uh, this art. And she actually also is the owner of a of a gallery in Montreal. And so um, it'd be interesting to know if there has been more traffic to her gallery as a result of this litigation. So that's a good litigation strategy, sort of enhance your reputation. Um, it could backfire, and it's expensive. But, but that's a really intriguing point. Thank you. So we're a pretty international group here. Um, and I'm just curious how these like individual laws in regions or countries kind of work across borders. Um, this case we've been looking at has like two Canadian artists, but I'm mm -hmm. curious, how would this lawsuit function if like Basmati was a US artist and yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. there was like a border in between these two um, people in this lawsuit? Well, thank you for that question. That's when the international agreements come into play. And generally, the, the, the lawsuit would be initiated um, under the laws of the jurisdiction where the infringement occurred. So if, if, if Basanta was in the United States doing what he did, um, then, uh, you know, the, generally speaking, the infringement would have occurred there and the laws of the United States and the U.S. as a jurisdiction would be the place in which the lawsuit would, would arise. And therefore, you know, that, I mean, there's um, obviously, as I, I mean, the laws are not the same, copyright laws are not the same uh, around the world, although they have similar features because um, but there would be different nuances depending on where the, uh, the, the Oops, I think my internet connection is, is getting weak, but there was so it, it, there are ways of handling that. Um, in terms of where the infringement takes place. Sorry that I interrupt you. Could you maybe repeat your last sentence as your connection was bad? Yes, I was just saying that the international agreements make it a possible sort of to have cross-border transnational lawsuits of this kind. Um, there aren't, the laws are not exactly the same. So, uh, you know, it matters in a sense which law applies, but generally the rule is the, the, the law of the jurisdiction where the infringement occurred. So not where the, the, copy, the, the, the original creator or the copyright holder is physically, but where the infringement occurs. So if Basanta was in the United States doing what he was doing, or if he was in Switzerland, it would be sort of a Swiss law that would have, uh, you know, that would, would govern the day. I would like you to maybe um, tell us a bit more about your strategy, how you've been addressing this. If I understood you correctly, it's um, a particular methodological approach to sort of uh, think and place the discourses on copyright, not on, on uh, mostly relating it to protecting something, mm -hmm. but to look at it as something that is enabling mm -hmm. and that is enabling for a common good. 
Right. And then you can prove this. You uh, came across this, if I am uh, understood you correctly, by looking at the, the history of copyright, how, how it has been introduced in Canada, and then you were looking for other patterns. I think this kind of strategy is also for us and in the student context quite interesting. So um, to see what kind of problematic disposition there is, and then to find the right methodological approach, sort of also with that, of course, showing a way how the discussion could run. And if you maybe could say a bit more about that again, in more detail, please. Uh, thank you. Um, you know, a part of the reason I started to, to inquire about history, the history, uh, and started to read about the his, the, those who had written about the copyright histories of the United States and France and, and, and the United Kingdom uh, was because of what I was seeing as this tendency towards this maximalist idea of copyright, more copyright is necessarily better. Um, and, and assumptions, these assumptions that started to sort of infiltrate the way in which our judges were deciding cases based on these, these assumptions about what copyright law was supposed to be doing. Um, and then they would make reference back to, they'd make statements like, we all know that Canadian copyright law is derived from, you know, and, and we don't know that. We didn't know that because the, you know, no one had ever really investigated this. Um, and, and that's when sort of in, in just in that de determination to investigate that question, um, the, the, the larger sort of um, context of copyrights history started to unfold for me. And that's when I, I, I was then started to be able to link what I was seeing in my own jurisdiction with what I was reading about sort of in these other jurisdictions. Um, and it caused me obviously to, to, to question even what I had been taught and my own assumptions about what uh, the law was, was, was designed to do. Um, and and the, I mean, just the, the history alone has been tremendously enriching. Looking at it from a legal perspective, I mean, what was ironic was, um, you know, there's a way to do there's legal research methods when you're trying to understand uh, legislation, how it came to be, you, you know, you know, right away, you go back and you look at the legislative journals and there are parliamentary debates and the uh, lawmakers debate why they enact the law and therefore you can get all the answers from that. And I thought that it would be an easy exercise. I'd just go back and look at the 1832 parliamentary debates and I'd get all of my answers. And I realized quickly that they didn't have parliamentary debates back then. They didn't record the debate. So I had no idea why they decided to create or initiate copyright law until I started to expand my own research horizon. I started to look at these petitioners I was telling you about. Who were these individuals? And it turns out they were teachers and what was their problem? And you, know, you start to build out um, a, a broader kind of lens, socio-political, historic, cultural lens from which to study this. What that did then was it, it taught me to break boundaries, at, at least sort of, you know, the legal discipline is very hermetically sealed. We don't, we're not comfortable in multidisciplinary spaces. But in order to do, to, to do a full inquiry, to kind of get to the bottom of, of you know, the, 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 as, as much truth as one can discover from the past, um, I had to broaden my scope. And that brought me into the whole and, and wonderfully rich realm of book history. So there's a body of scholars, there's a, a large group of scholars, it's a multidisciplinary discipline of people who study publishing history, printing, book, you know, the, the, the books as material objects, how they land, you know, sort of one book, you know, translated in multiple languages in different countries when they were, you know, in, 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 in the past, how they were experienced by different people around the world. And copyright became part of that. It, it effectively was the law of the book, um, you know, and so the, the realm of book history became a, a relevant lens through which to understand sort of the, the, the nature of the law. So, so method kind of uh, method one, you know, sort of looking at things from a narrow lens, um, I was forced to expand my horizon and look more broadly and, and bring in more disciplines into my research. And, and that has been a hugely enriching 
both personally, but rewarding in terms of my being able to take the legal discourse and advance it sort of in a way that actually situates it within not only what was happening in 19th century, uh, you know, British North America, but then can transpose it into um, ways in which to look at copyright today. So I don't know if that answers your question, but but it, it's been a remark. It's been a really very very rewarding and enriching journey, I can say. And there's a lot of it's a lot of fun looking through dusty archives. <laughs> Are there any any more questions? Because otherwise I would maybe um, uh, say thank you for contributing and thank you for uh, your talk and your stuff. It was a very interesting time for us all. Um, yes. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you very much for having me. It's been a real pleasure. I, I enjoyed this very much. Best wishes from across the ocean. Bye-bye. <laughs>